Let's go in our Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 2. Where are we going to? Deuteronomy, the second chapter. The Bible tells us in verse number 7 of Deuteronomy chapter 2 that they wandered for 40 years in that great wilderness. That's verse 7. And look now in verse number 1 of Deuteronomy chapter 2. The Bible tells us in verse number 1. Are we there? The Bible tells us in verse 1, Then we turn and took our journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea, as the Lord spake unto me. And we compassed Mount Seir many days, 40 years, based on verse number 7. And verse number 2 now says, And the Lord spake unto me, saying, You have compassed this mountain long enough. And what are the next three words? He says, Turn ye northward turn you northward and what does it mean to turn northward inspiration says in patriarchs and prophets page 433 it says this after passing the south of edom the israelites turned northward turn where turn northward listen now what what that means and again set their faces to where toward the promised land. And as God told them, turn northward, set your faces toward the promised land, God is now showing us current events, which point to the fact it's time for us to turn northward. It's time for us to set our faces toward the promised land because we are nearing home. We are nearing the entering of the heavenly land called Canaan. And the Bible tells us in Luke 21 that when we see this global fear factor in the world, men's hearts failing them for fear, it's in this time we must turn northward. It's in this time we must set our faces up toward the promised land. Do we not see that ISIS, radical Islam, has been let loose upon this earth? That men's hearts is failing them for fear both in wars, terrorism, as well as in the global financial crisis. Men are fearful, not knowing what tomorrow holds. Luke 21, are we there, my friends? Verse number 25 says, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth, what, my friends? Distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea, and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be what? Shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Let's read now verse 28 together. And when these things begin to come to pass, then do what? Turn northward, then look up. And lift up your heads, why? For your redemption draweth nigh. That word fear, in verse number 26, men's hearts failing them for fear. That word fear means terror, from which we get the word terrorism. And since September 11, 2001, we have entered this global crisis, terrorism. Islam is doing its work in the land and the Bible tells us when these things begin to come to pass it's time for us to look where to look uh, northward why probation is about to close the second coming of Christ is near when these things begin to come to pass then look up and what is now the primary solution to combat terrorism the primary solution is we need to unite all the nations under one head, under which entity? Under the Vatican, under the papacy. All these nations must be brought under the papacy. And the Bible tells us, let's go in our Bibles, Revelation 13. And the Bible tells us that when we begin to see this, the papacy begins to receive the accolades, the influence that she once had between A.D. 538 and 1798. Probation's hour is fast closing. And when the papacy receives this control over the various nations to combat so-called terrorism, the Bible tells us that she will support 
the enforcement of the national Sunday law and persecute God's faithful people. How close are we, my friends? Listen to what this says. This is New York Times. And notice what John Kerry said. He said, headline, he said, to defeat terror, what do we need? We need to unite all the various nations. Unite these nations under whom? Under what entity? It says here in Catholic News Service, Shimon Perez says, Francis, Pope Francis, is a what? A more powerful peace advocate than whom? Than the United Nations, than all the nations put together. Bring these nations under whom? Under the Vatican. Catholic News Service, it says, Pope Francis, let's read, is the what? Is the only leader respected enough to what? To end up today's uh, wars. So where are these wars leading? To what event? To bring all the nations under the Vatican, under the papacy. And Revelation chapter 13, look with me here. Revelation chapter 13, are we there my friends? Verse 1 through verse 2 brings to view, bring to view the papacy. And verse number 3 says, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, 1798, and his deadly wound was healed when the mark of the beast is enforced. And what? All the world what? Wondered after the beast. And they worship the dragon. Is the world now wandering after the beast? Listen, so what follows in verse number 4? And what? And worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast. So now, how close are we to the enforcement of the national Sunday law? And verse number seven tells us, persecution is coming. Verse number eight tells us, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written where? In the Lamb Book of Life. Listen to what this says, my friends. Bright Bart says, even Obama, is yielding to the will of the papacy. It says here, Obama states, Pope issued personal appeal to me and Castro on Cuba, and both leaders surrendered their will to whose will? The desires of whom? The papacy. Men's hearts failing them for fear. When we see this, the Bible says, look up, lift up your heads. Why? Your redemption draweth now, that tells me it's time for us to turn northward. It's time for us to understand that we are nearing home, not just that current events are being fulfilled. The Bible tells us while men's hearts are failing them for fear, God is now sealing his people. Close your place in chapter 13 of Revelation. Let's go in our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 8. Where are we going to? Isaiah chapter 8. Friends, are you being sealed? And we are told in the book Maranatha, page 200 and 201, that the sealing is not something the natural eye can see, but it is a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so that we cannot be moved. We're not moved by every false wind of doctrine. We're not moved and shaken out by problems persecutions and tribulation. No, we are rooted and grounded in Christ. Are you being sealed? And remember, the seal of God is a Sabbath. But many of us may attend church on the Sabbath, but are you sanctified? Ezekiel 20 verse 12 says, I have given them my Sabbath as a sign that they might know I am the Lord that doth sanctify them. Are you being sealed? All right, Isaiah chapter 8. Oh, friends, let me tell you where we're going in the study here. I have two primary emphasis in this study. Number one, it's personal evangelism. It's time to win souls, my friends. It's time to win souls. And number two, heart conversion. Look with me, Isaiah chapter 8. It's time to turn northward. Men's hearts failing them for fear. And then shall they see... The Son of Man coming, Isaiah chapter 8. Are we there, my friends? The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 9, Associate yourselves, O ye people, and you shall be what? Broken in pieces. I wish I could stop here. Because this is Daniel chapter 2. 
are the nations now uniting because of ISIS, because of Islam. Let's all unite under one head. Associate means to unite. Is that clear, my friends? But the Bible says once they unite, they shall be what? Broken into what? Into pieces. In Daniel chapter 2, what is cut out without hands that smites the image on his feet and shatters, break everything into pieces? The stone, and who is the stone a symbol of? What is the stone a symbol of? The second coming of Jesus Christ. Is that clear, my friends? So now are the nations associating together? Is it going on right now? So what is next? The stone is about to descend. It's time to turn where? Northward. We are nearing home, Isaiah chapter 8. But before we can enter home, we have to be sealed by God. Skip on down. Don't have much time here. Skip on down with me to verse number 11. Bible says, For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me, let's read, that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Say you not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy, neither fear you their fear, nor be what? Afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. Is the world in a spirit of fear right now? Financially, as it relates to terrorism, even as it relates to calamities, earthquakes and hurricanes, etc., snowstorms, is the world in a time of fear? Notice now in verse 16, what is God now doing? He says what now? He says, bind up the testimony and do what? Seal the what? The law among my disciples. Is God now sealing his people? And the question is, are you being sealed by God? Are you daily dropping off sin? Asking God for power to surrender your sinful desires. The Bible tells us it's time for us to turn northward. Men's hearts failing them for fear. We are nearing home. The signs in the world show us probation is about to close. But what about the signs in the church? What is a primary, I said, what is a final sign that shows in the church that human probation is about to close? It's time to turn northward. What is that sign in the church? Yes, we can all say apostasy. That's an umbrella language. But let me tell you something. The Bible tells us when the church begins to reject the spirit of prophecy, we are living in the last days of this earth's history. Close wherever you're holding in scripture. Let's turn our Bible to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Where are we going to? 2 Chronicles chapter 36. When God's professed people begin to reject the spirit of prophecy, it shows we are living in the closing moments of this earth's history and God's remnant denomination out of which he will have a remnant people this denomination has already begun to reject the writings of the spirit of prophecy and inspiration says when this takes place it's time to look up lift up your heads your redemption draweth nigh probation is about to close second chronicles chapter 36 are we there, my friends? The Bible says in verse 14, Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people, how many priests? All the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abom... Let me read, preacher. Thank you so much. After all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. Listen now. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending. Why? Because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But what did they do in verse 16? Come on, talk to me now. What did they do? Verse 16. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and what? And misused his prophets until... The wrath of the Lord rose up against his people till there was no remedy. Question for you. So what was the last thing that happened? 
they mock God's messengers. It says what? They misused the prophets until what? The wrath of God fell upon the people. And verse 17 says uh, that the temple, Solomon's temple, was destroyed. What was that last sin? They misused the prophets, uh, mocked the prophets. Uh, what is the wrath of God in the last days? Come on, the seven last plagues. Uh, this tells me then, and which event uh, brings signals precede the seven last plagues? Uh, the mark of the beast. If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So until we get to the wrath of God, what will God's people be found doing? Rejecting the prophet, the final sin. All right, that was one scripture. Go to Matthew chapter 23 with me. Whatever we believe, we should be able to use two or three scriptures to confirm what we believe. In 2 Chronicles chapter 36, just before the destruction of Solomon's temple, the Bible tells us the final sin was the rejection of the prophet. All right, Matthew chapter 23. Are we there, my friends? Notice now, what was the final sin that Christ listed as the sin that brought the destruction of the, the rebuilding of the temple. That temple that Nehemiah and, and, and Ezra and, and the rest erected. What, what was that sin? Joshua and Zechariah, what was that sin? All right, Matthew 23, verse 37, are we there? Bible says, O Jerusalem, who is speaking here? Christ, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that what? Killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and you would not behold your house. It's left unto you are desolate, for I say unto you, you won't see me from this point forward until my return. And Matthew 24, verse 1 through verse 3, Christ now says, There shall not be left one stone upon another. All will be thrown down. Again, what was that last sin? The rejection of whom? The prophet. Notice now, selected messages. Of book 1, page 48 says, what's the first sentence right there? It says the very last one. All right, the very last deception of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. Did we not just prove that from Scripture? All right, it says the very last deception. What does last mean? What follows last? All right, the very last deception of Satan, listen carefully, will be to make of none effect the testimony of of the spirit of God, the spirit of prophecy. Where there is no vision, the people perish, Proverbs 29, 18. Listen, Satan will work ingeniously in different ways and through different what? Agencies to unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the true testimony. There will be a hatred kindled against the testimonies which is satanic so those who are rejecting the spirit of prophecy they are possessed with the devil all right listen to what it says it says the workings of satan will be to unsettle the faith of the churches in them for what reason for this reason satan cannot have so clear a track to bring in his deceptions and bind up souls in his delusions. Uh, let's read. If the warnings and reproofs and counsels uh, of the Spirit of God are heeded. Now, what events show us that this quotation is being fulfilled? Watch this. In 2004, 2005, general conference session of Seventh-day Adventism, notice what was voted. Headline, World Church Spirit of Prophecy Resolution Voted. Points Church to the Bible. Listen to what they voted. It says, the resolution notes, the study of Mistress White's writings will constantly lead the church back to the Bible as the very foundation of faith and practice. He added, let's read, 
that the gift exercise by Ellen G. White, listen, can enrich but not define our faith and practice. Does that make sense to you? Now, why would God send us a prophet? And that prophetess, that messenger of God, would give us testimonies as coming from God, yet her words cannot define the faith. Why do we need her then? Why do we need her writings then? If her writings cannot define how we should live or a practice, is this not a rejection of the spirit of prophecy? The very last deception. What year was this? 2004? 2005 general conference session. What year are we living in right now? 2015. What's coming up in June, July? 2015 general conference session. Look at what they're planning to vote. Watch this. Many of you who were baptized in the popular churches, you were all given this book called 20, pardon me, Seven Day Adventists Believe, a biblical exposition of 27 fundamental doctrines, right? Now, this is, now they have 28. They keep counting. But hold the point right there. This is the present statement in the book right now. And then let's look at what the change statement is that they're planning to vote in 2015. This is from the website Adventist.org. Listen to what it says. Number 18 in the book. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is prophecy. This gift is an identifying mark of the remnant church and was manifested in the ministry of whom? Ellen G. White. Listen now. This is a present statement. As the Lord's messenger, her writings are, are continuing and authoritative source of truth. Listen to the change statement now that they're planning to vote in 2015 this summer. The scripture testifies, let's move on. This gift is an identifying mark of the remnant church and we believe it. Sounds good, right? And we believe it was manifested in the ministry of Ellen G. White. Where is as the Lord's messenger? It's taken out. Her writings speak with what? Prophetic authority. So only on prophecy just study her writings. Well, she's right. Because she prophesied you would reject her writings. Where is the Lord's messenger? Do you remember they asked Sister White the question, are you a prophet? Are you a prophetess? And what was her response? My work is more than that of a prophet. I am the messenger of the Lord. We have taken that out. Her writings speak with what? Prophetic authority and provide comfort guidance and instruction and correction to the church. What's missing here? Let's go back to the present statement. Again, not saying the present statement is 100% foolproof either. But the present statement says, as the Lord's messenger, her writings are what? Are continuing. Why did we change that? Why? What is the implication here? The very last deception of Satan is to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. Her writings can own, cannot define our faith and practice. Now, on number one, now, now I'm going to deal with this in the near future. On some of those points that they're changing, go with me in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. Where are we going to? Fundamental belief number one. Listen what the present statement says about the Holy Scriptures. And then let's take a look at what the changed statement is. I wonder why they changed this. Remember, Sister White says, once you reject my writings, the testimony of God's Spirit, you will, you will reject the Bible as well. And fundamental belief number one says this. Watch, it says, the, whole, the Holy Scriptures, Old and New Testaments are the written word of God. Let's read now. Given by whom? Divine inspiration through holy men of God. Who spoke and wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Listen now to the change statement that now they're planning to vote in. 
Bottom paragraph says, uh, the Holy Scriptures, Old and New Testaments, are the written word of God given by divine inspiration, period. The inspired authors. What's missing from that statement? Holy men of God. And that top paragraph right here, in the purple heading, the purple heading, it says, uh, we made that change because we want the language uh, to be inclusive, gender inclusive. From Genesis to Revelation, which woman wrote a book in the Bible? Have we lost our bearings? Second Peter chapter one. The very last deception of Satan is to make of none effect uh, the testimony of the Spirit of God. Let's make sure that the, the previous statement is still in our Bibles, right? 2 Peter chapter 1. Are we there, my friends? Uh, look with me at verse 21, what it says. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The very last deception of Satan. While the majority of us are sleeping spiritually, Satan is laying plans to both deceive and to overthrow professed Seventh-day Adventism. And when somebody stands up and says something, you say, oh, you're too critical. Keep talking, my friends. That's what they did with the prophets of old. As a result, probation closed upon them. Why would they want to change God's word? When, when it is specific, holy men of God, but now the inspired authors. What are they heading to? Could this be one step up to support women's ordination? Women being elders and pastors in the church? Wake up, my friends, Deuteronomy. Where are we going to, my friends? Is it time to turn northward? Is the very last deception here? When you see all these things, begin to come to pass the bible tells us look up lift up your heads why your redemption draweth nigh probation is about to close it's time to head toward the promised land when god told ancient israel to turn northward set your faces now toward the promised land god told them now this is for deep bible students now Every Sabbath, God has to feed people on different levels spiritually. It doesn't matter if you're not here as yet, by God's grace, before probation closes, you have to reach this height spiritually. God told them that they were not to destroy three nations. The three nations were Edom, Moab, and Ammon. Why these three nations? Yet they were to destroy all the other nations. Inspiration says the reason why, because Edom, Moab, and Ammon, probation had not yet closed upon them. Patriots and prophets, page 423 confirms that. Look with me now. Deuteronomy, what chapter? Chapter 2. Deuteronomy, and as God is telling us, it's time to head northward. He's telling us, oh, seven-day Adventists, prepare yourselves. Edom, Moab, and Ammon are coming. Edom, Moab, and Ammon, they represent a group of people in the last days who will accept God's present truth, God's sealing message, God's early and latter rain messages, and they will not receive the mark of the beast. As God says, turn northward, they were not to destroy which three nations? Edom, Moab, and Ammon. Let's study Deuteronomy chapter 2. Are we there, my friends? My emphasis this day is on evangelism. It's time to turn northward. It's time to preach, teach, educate the church, agitate Seventh-day Adventists. It's time now to reach the world, my friends. Listen, Deuteronomy chapter 2, are we there? All right, verse number 4 and verse number 5. I'm going to reference some things right here. Then in Bible class, I'm going to go back over these things. And most of you who are here at Safe to Serve, we have gone through Edom, Moab, and Ammon before. But now notice, verse number 4, verse number 5, mention Esau. What was Esau's name as well? Edom. Beside verse number 5, 
Beside verse number 5, write down Genesis 25 and verse 30. What text? Genesis 25, what verse? Verse 30, Esau is Edom. Look with me now, verse number 9. In verse number 9, we find the nation of the Moabites. So we have Edom and Moab. Look at verse 9 with me. Are we there? The Bible says, And the Lord said unto me, Distress not whom the Moabites. Skip on down to verse number 19. So we have Edom, Moab. Look now at Ammon. Verse number 19. And when thou comest nigh over against the children of Ammon, what should they not do? Distress them not. Their probation is not yet closed. Edom, Moab, and Ammon destroy all the rest because their probation is closed. This is telling us, as God is telling us, it's time to head northward. It's time for us to prepare to enter into heaven. The Bible is telling us, look out, Edom, Moab, and Ammon, people in the world, they are ready to accept the gospel. Edom, Moab, and Ammon will not receive the mark of the beast. Look with me. Beside verse number, verse number 5, write down Daniel chapter 11, verse 40 and verse 41. Where are we going to? Daniel chapter 11, verse 40 and verse 41. Let's go there. Nothing in the Bible is by accident. These aren't bedtime stories. No, my friends. All these things that happened before time were written for our learning. Applications of them should be made in these last days. Daniel chapter 11. Are we there? You have to listen. I'm not wasting your time this morning. You're going to see why I'm taking my time to explain Edom, Moab, and Ammon. They represent people in the last days who will not receive the mark of the beast. They will be saved. But who will give them the message? Seven-day Adventists who are sealed with the latter rain message. Daniel chapter 11, are we there? Verse 40 says, At the time of the end, the king of the south, underscore that, push at him. And the king of the north, underscore that, shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, with horsemen, with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Look at verse 41 now. And he shall enter also into the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of the papacy's hand. These shall escape out of Satan's hand. These shall escape out of his hand. Who are they? Even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. Beside verse 41 of Daniel chapter 11. Write down in your Bibles. Come on. When you come to say to serve, you come to study. Write down Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah what chapter? Isaiah chapter 11. And write down verse number 12 through verse 14. Let's go there. Isaiah chapter 11, verse number 12 through verse 14. Edom, Moab, and Ammon, Israel, don't destroy them. They will accept the truth. Their probation is not yet closed. So it is. As God is telling us, turn northward. Look out, Seventh-day Adventists. Get ready to reap Edom, Moab, Ammon. Isaiah chapter 11. Are we there? Are we there? Verse number, verse number 12. Bible puts it this way in verse 12. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And verse 13 says, God's church will be united. That's verse 13. Verse 14 now says, God's people, like David, shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines. Who overthrew that giant Philistine? David, that's not some bedtime story. David represents converted, sealed, seven-day Adventists that will fly upon the giants in the land. And these sealed seven-day Adventists will be the ones to reach Edom, Moab, and Ammon and bring them into God's truth. You don't believe me? Look at verse 14. Believe the Lord. Verse 14, I'll be there. 
But they, God's people, shall fly on the shoulders of, of the Philistines toward the west. They shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their what? Hand upon whom? Edom and whom? Moab and whom? And the children of Ammon shall what? Obey God's people's words. Deuteronomy chapter 2. Go back there, my friends. Notice now, God says what now? Turn you northward. This evening, I'll go deeper on that point. But you have to see that point because this point is critical now. When God told ancient Israel, you have come past this wilderness 40 years now. Your journey is over. It's time to turn northward. Set your faces now toward the promised land. God said, you are going to encounter two kings, and those two kings are going to withstand your progress. Before God's people entered Canaan, turn you northward. The Bible tells us two kings stood in their way. How many kings? Which two kings? Deuteronomy chapter 2 tells us the first king is King Sihon. Who? King Sihon and the second king, King Og. Deuteronomy chapter 2. Are we there, my friends? Why is this so important? As we have come to the closing scenes of this earth's history, before we can enter heaven, two kings are going to stand in our way. Two kings will stand in our way. Look with me. Deuteronomy chapter 2. Are we there, my friends? Look at verse number 30. Bible says, but whom? But Sion, king of Heshbon, would not let us pass by him. Did he try to withstood God's people? And verse number 31. Verse number 30 says, God removed Sion. Verse number 31. And the Lord now said, Behold, I have begun to give Sion and his land before thee, begin to what? Possess, that thou mayest inherit his land. Then Sion came out against us, he and all his people, to fight us. And verse 33 says, And the Lord our God, what? Delivered him before us, and we smote him. That's the first king. The second king is King Og. Deuteronomy chapter 3 now. Look at verse 1. Are we there? Then we turned and went up the way to Bashan. Many times we think these are bedtime stories, right? Watch the point. Then we turned and went up the way to Bashan. And who now? Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us. He and all his people, the battle at Endre, did God overthrow Og as well. And verse number eight, verse number eight now says, and we took at that time, out of the hand of how many kings? Of the two kings of the Amorites, their lands. A question now, so how many kings stood before Israel to withstand them from entering into Canaan, two kings? In the last days, who are the two kings that will stand up against God's people? When God is telling us the signs are in the church, the signs are in the world, it's time to head, set your face toward my second coming. Who are these two kings? The king of the south and the king of the north. Let me connect, connect these dots now. In Deuteronomy 2 and 3, what three nations do we see there? That God said were to be spared? Edom. Moab and Ammon. Wake up now. And how many kings in the same scripture withstood Israel? Two. All right. In Daniel chapter 11, do we find those three nations? Edom, Moab, and Ammon. Do we see the same two kings over there? Do we find two kings in Daniel chapter 11? Go back there now. Where are we going to, friends? Daniel chapter 11. This is how we compare scripture. This is how we know we have God's truth. Daniel chapter 11 now. Are we there, my friends? Father in heaven, give us more of thy spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Look with me now at verse 40. Are we there, my friends? Verse 40, are we there? What are the two kings in verse 40? What are they, my friends? Who are they? The king of the south and the king of the north. Let's pause there now. Who, geographically, in Bible times, is called the king of the south? 
It's Egypt. Literally Egypt. And what was Egypt known for? Talk to me. Egypt. What did Pharaoh say? Who is God that I should obey him? So does Egypt, is Egypt known as the land of atheism? Did Pharaoh persecute God's people and restrict them from worshiping God in spirit and in truth down there in Egypt? And notice now, when a nation rejects God and God's truth, that nation will also find itself practicing licentiousness. To reject God, atheism also leads to what? Sodomy. Egypt is connected with sodomy in scripture. Revelation chapter 11. Where are we going to my friends? Listen to me carefully now. Chapter 11 of Revelation. The Bible tells us in verse 7 and in verse 8. As it was in France now. France. During the French Revolution. Manifested atheism and licentiousness. Sodomy. From which America got that statue, the Statue of Liberty. We want liberty. We want freedom from God's word. That Statue of Liberty was a harlot. And the statue was moved to which land? America. I wonder if God allowed that providentially to take place. Telling us what happened in France. Atheism. Immorality will be prevalent in the United States of America. Hear me carefully now. What, what we're going to see, laws are now being passed. What, my friends? Laws are now being enacted to support and to strengthen the LGBT movement. And simultaneously, laws are being passed to silence God's faithful preachers from calling sin by its right name. Oh, friends, one of the kings has already stood up against God's people. Look here. Look here what this says. Uh, Obama, LGBT, executive order does what? Endangers um, religious uh, liberty. And this week, we are told, my friend, this week, it says here, the Indiana governor, Mike Pence, he amended this bill that was written to so-called strengthen religious liberty. And the second draft of the bill, instead of strengthening liberties, what did it do? It destroyed liberties and strengthened the LGBT movement. Listen, friends. And the U.S. Supreme Court is now preparing to pass a law this summer to strengthen the LGBT movement. That's one side of the coin. But the other side of the coin is uh, you cannot call the LGBT lifestyle a sin, or it is named, labeled discrimination. You're not hearing me. You're not hearing me, my friends. Listen, how on, all, how on earth are we going to head home if we don't live and preach the gospel? When Matthew 24, verse 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. But one of the two kings has already stood up. You can call sin by its right name. And what is a definition of the gospel? Matthew chapter 1, verse 21 says, His name shall be called Jesus. Why? He shall save his people from their sins, his homosexuality and lesbianism as sin. Listen, what happened in France? Did they burn Bibles in France during, during the French Revolution? What's going on now in America? They are burning Bibles figuratively. You can call sin by its right name. Have you forgotten this? A seven-day Adventist, Eric Walsh? who was a, a health director. And what happened? They went and they listened to a number of his sermons on YouTube. And they fired him from his job. Why? Because he called homosexuality a sin. Bec listen, let's read. He had made 
about homosexuality and evolution in online videos and audio clips in sermons uploaded to various websites, Walsh, a Seventh-day Adventist preacher, calls evolution a religion created by Satan, compares Disney World. Disneyland, Disney, to a dark empire of superstition and witchcraft and criticizes homosexuality. As a result, he was terminated from his public office. Do we not see what's going on, my friends? And let me tell you something. Is the king of the South already in America outside of the church? Is it now we're standing God's people? We can't go home unless the gospel is lived and preached, unless sin is called sin. And truth is called righteousness. That's why inspiration says, the greatest want of the world is the want of men. Men who will not be bought or sold. Men who in the innermost souls are true and honest. Men who will not be afraid to call sin by its right name. Is the king of the south standing up now? But I want to tell you something. The king of the south is also in the church. Within the Seventh-day Adventist church, there's a movement in the denomination now. Young people leading out, young adults leading out, and they want support for members who are already in our churches who are practicing the lifestyle of the LGBTQIT lifestyle. They want all the alphabets you see. Now hear me. And they want these people who are practicing lesbians and homosexuals to retain membership in the church. Hear me carefully. And it's, it's a movement now in the church. But nobody's telling you this. But let me tell you what God says. And what they're now saying is they want the church to be a safe place for, for practicing homosexuals and lesbians. Well, let me tell you something. If you want the church to be a safe place for homosexuality, then guess what? Truth and error can't mix. That means in those churches, those ministers, elders, and deacons will have to keep silent. They will not be able to, to call sin by its right name. So in the church, the king of the south is already here. Listen to what this says. Spectrum magazine. Now, friends, you should know. For a pastor to stand up and preach a sermon saying, Adam and Steve, Eve and Geneva. It's okay for that union. It must tell you something about the campus, the school itself. Adam and Steve, move on. This week, April 2nd, 2015, Adventist Today says, this is a play, a drama, opens in Walla Walla University about what? Growing up, Adventist and gay. They don't go together. Adventists mean you are awaiting the second coming of Christ. You can await the second coming of Christ practicing sin. Homosexuality is a sin, and God can give us deliverance from every sin. Listen, Spectrum Magazine, it says, uh, Shakespeare, Walla Walla Church and School presents what? A gay SDA play. What's going on? Why do we need a drum? Why do we need a skit? Why do we need a play? Huh? Parading sin. Could this be a movement gradually permeating and massaging the minds of Seventh-day Adventists to accept this filth? Go with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 3. Where are we going to, my friends? It's interesting. The movement has begun on the campuses of children and youth and young adults. And remember, our churches nowadays are being moved and shaken by young people. Listen to what this says, my friends. Younger Adventist does what? What's the headline here? Younger Adventist, this is prophecy. Younger Adventist pave the road ahead. On what? On church gay issues. This is from the school's website. 
quote, it was a standing ovation at the end of the gay play. And that included administration and faculty members from Walla Walla University. Akers recalled, quote, the, conver the conversation is not a new one, but the need to create safe environments for LGBT members in churches and schools. What's going to happen, my friends? And this is why they want to discard the spirit of prophecy. This is why they want to change the words of Scripture. Satan cannot get his agenda sailing through Adventism unless uh, he puts out the light. He puts out the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And this is happening today, March 30th, March 30th, 2015. But remember in the Netherlands, the whole union of the, Nether of, of the Netherlands said, we want to make our churches a safe place for LGBTI individuals. In other words, pastors cannot call sin by its right name. And this is taking over the majority of our school campuses. And now you're going to ask me, Pastor, where should I send my young daughter, my son to school? You better fast and pray about that one. This is IAGC. Look what they're doing with the even, the, well, the logos are with the pagan. So they can, they can all also make it pagan. Hear me carefully, friends. The Bible tells us it is Satan's plan to put his throne above the throne of God, above the stars of God. What sits and encircles God's throne? Based on chapter 4 and 5 of the Revelation, it's the rainbow. This is why Satan has taken the rainbow as his signet, his ensign of abomination. And you want to bring that into God's church and God's school? Listen, this is going on on Andrews University, La Sierra, PUC, Union College, Southern Adventist University, Washington Adventist University, and Walla Walla University. All these schools are, are pushing and supporting the LGBT movement. And the Bible tells us, you know you're in the last days when young people are changing the church. Isaiah chapter 3. Is it time to move forward? Isaiah chapter 3. Are we there, my friends? The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 3 and verse number 12, and the context of Isaiah chapter 3 is the last days. And verse 12 now says, As for my people, what? Children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err. So who is leading? The young people and women ruling, that's women's ordination in the context with children, young people, students, and what movement are these students leading out in? Oh, friends, the LGBT movement. Is it time now to turn northward? Is the king of the south already in the world and in the church? So what about the king of the north? Who does he represent? The king of the north is the papacy. Not Islam, it's the papacy. Satan desires, Isaiah 14, to put his stone in the sides of the north. Who dwells in the north? Christ, God's kingdom, God's throne, it's in the north. Satan desires to put his throne in the north. And which entity is Satan's primary entity to deceive mankind? The papacy, the king of the north. Question now, did those two kings withstand Israel? Did they try? Are two powers now trying to withstand God's people? Listen what the papacy is now saying. You know this. What he says, if you preach against Roman Catholicism, what will you get? You will get persecutions, punch. Oh, friends, are we here? Deuteronomy chapter 2. Where are we going to, my friends? 
Beloved, I want to tell you something. Hear me carefully. Our focus here is evangelism. Is what, my friends? It's time to turn northward. And the Bible tells us uh, when Moses uh, and the Israelites uh, saw those two kings, uh, do you know what God told Moses? He said, do not fear their faces. Is the king of the south uh, and north, uh, both in the world and in the church. Our pastors now saying, don't preach such messages. You are a troubler in Israel. Is the principle, the traits of character of the king of the south and north in the church. But what is God telling us? Do not fear their faces. Since 2001, the Patriot Act was passed, right? They can spy on you now, right? They know all of your conversations, right? They are tracking you and tracing you. They even say, hear me, they even say, if you are a professed Christian and you believe in the book of Revelation, you are a terrorist. Do you know someone wrote me today, uh, uh, this week, and the person said, here in Canada, the book Great Controversy is banned in some places. Yes, sir. The family, husband and wife, ordered a, a, two cases of great controversies. And the, 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 the Adventist bookstore over there refunded their money. And they're like, why? And they called. And after a few calls and a few conversations, they were told, husband and wife, the bookstore said they do not want this book to be circulated in Canada. Are the kings standing trying to withstand God's people from giving the gospel message? Yes, I wonder if this is why our president and others, instead of printing and circulating the book, The Great Controversy, we have now passed out the great hope. But what does God say? Do not fear their faces. Amen. Listen to me carefully. The pastors who are afraid to stand for God's truth, both in the church and in the world, they represent the Israelites who came to the borders of Canaan. And when they saw the giants, they trembled and in unbelief did not honor God. Did they die in that wilderness? Because they feared the giants. But what is God saying to us now, Seventh-day Adventists? Safe to serve, what is God now saying to us? Do not fear their faces. Deuteronomy chapter 2. My focus, so my friends, must we scatter great controversy? But make sure our lives are also in harmony with the book. Must we preach God's truth? Must we call sin by its right name? Must we uplift God's righteousness? Don't be afraid of what NSA can do to you. Don't be afraid of what uh, these, uh, name them, what are they? Uh, CIA, you know them, FBI, which one? Don't be afraid, God says what? Leave my truth and give the message. Don't stutter, don't have knocking knees. No, don't fear there. Look with me, Deuteronomy chapter 3. Are we there, my friends? Verse 1, listen. Then we turned and went up the way to Bashan. And Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us, he and all his people, to battle at Endrai. And listen now, let's read verse 2. And the Lord said unto me, Fear him not. Why? for I will deliver him. So should we be afraid of the mark of the beast? I've heard some so-called present truth pastors say, I won't put certain sermons on YouTube or write certain articles. Look at what they did to Eric Walsh. I won't follow. No, friends, God says what? Do not fear their faces. Hear me carefully. When the Pope comes to America, Big gathering, right? What does God say when large gatherings take place in our cities? God says in the book Evangelism, we should go to these large gatherings and scatter 
truth, field, literature, all around. But now someone now may say, well, pastor, the police officers may try to withstand us. Folks may criticize us. What does God say? Do not fear their faces. Listen to what this says. Does army consider Christians, even Tea Party, a terror threat? This article on Fox News says in 2013, if you believe in the apocalypse, you are a terrorist. Let's move on. Testimonies for the church. Volume 5, page 463 says, the, let's read the work which the church has failed to do in a time of peace and prosperity. She will have to do when? She will have to do when? She will have to do when? In a terrible crisis, under most discouraging, forbidden circumstances. Listen, listen, listen. Let me read. The warnings that worldly conformity has silenced or withheld must be given under the fiercest opposition from the enemies of the faith. And at that time, the superficial conservative class whose influence has steadily retarded the progress of the work will do what? will renounce the faith and take their stand with its avowed enemies toward whom their sympathies have long been tending. Pause right there. So these pastors within the Seventh-day Adventist churches who are now reaching out their hands to unite with Babylon preachers, they're going to join with them. Because their love and sympathy to unite with them in sin is present. And they will join with them? Some of you ask, is the king of the south and north already in the church? It says, listen, it says, uh, these what? Right here. These what? Let's read now slowly. These apostates will then manifest the most bitter enmity, doing all in their power to oppress and malign their former brethren and to excite indignation against them. This day is just before us. So who will try to withstand us from doing God's work? Enemies, we're in the church. The two kings are also in one sense in the church and Christ said in Matthew chapter 10 your foes will be even of your own household is that clear my friends John chapter 14 where we're going to my friends John chapter 14 two kings to withstand God's people in the days of Moses two kings are present outside of the church two kings are present in the church and for some of us, our unconverted spouse is that king also. To withstand you, to withstand you, to withstand you from living for God. Oh yes, some of us, our peers can be likened unto those two kings trying to hinder us from heading northward, getting ready for the second coming of Christ. Some of us, we have allowed our children to be hindering us. We are compromising with our children. They are the kings hindering us from living for God. John chapter 14. Beloved, I want to tell you something as we close this sermon here. Listen carefully this study. Hear me carefully. There are two kings I want you to see. Not the king of the south and the north right now. But there are two kings. One on the outside and one on the inside. And the king on the outside, it is Satan with his temptations. Who? Satan with his temptations. And the king on the inside, it's our sinful, carnal desires. And if we are not converted and overcome the giant within, the sinful desires within, then Satan, the king on the outside, will lead us to sin and also lead us to damnation. But we don't have to fear 
Satan, the king on the outside, once we get victory over the king on the inside, our sinful, carnal desires. Notice now the words of Christ. John chapter 14. Are these things clear, my friend? Yes. John chapter 14, verse 13. No, friends, should we now head northward? But will two kings attempt to stand in our way? And the greatest battle ever fought is the battle over self. That's the king. Look with me. John chapter 14, verse 30. Are we there, my friends? Uh, listen carefully. Hereafter, Christ says, hereafter, John 14, 30. I will not talk much with you. Why? For the ruler, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Was there a king on the outside? Did Satan tempt Christ? But because there was no sinful desire inside of Christ, there was no response to Satan's temptation on the outside. And inspiration says, if we are going to be saved, we have to overcome the lustful, sinful king desires on the inside so that when Satan bring those uh, perverted scents, when Satan bring those uh, perverted music, when Satan tempts us with the perverted dress, the perverted diet, when Satan tempts us with anything on the outside, because we have surrendered our will to God, the king on the inside is now suppressed. We have victory over sin. Nothing that Satan does can ever move us. We have to overcome sin. Listen to what this says. Desire of ages. It's time to head northward. But we have to overcome these two kings. And what does God say? Do not what? Do not fear. Do you know some of us, we are fearful? Oh, pastor, I don't know if I'm going to make it. What does God say? Many of us, we have giants. Some of us, our temptations feel as if they are greater than we can ever overcome. We should never pray, dear God, bring the temptation down to where I can handle it. No, give me the faith strong enough to overcome the giants. It was Caleb and Joshua who said, don't fear the giants in the land. Why? We are well able to overcome. Do not fear what Satan can do. Just surrender everything to Christ. And those two kings can never overthrow us. Listen to what this says, uh, page 123, Desire of Ages. Listen carefully. It says, uh, The prince of this world cometh, said Jesus, and hath nothing in me. There was in Jesus, listen, there was in Jesus, say that with me. This is where Satan puts many of us to sleep when we get to practical godliness. We have just seen urgency now. Where is the practical godliness? All right. It says there was nothing in Jesus. All right. There was nothing in Jesus that responded to Satan's sophistry. So where was Satan? On the outside. Amen. Listen now. He, Jesus, did not consent to sin. What does it mean to consent? To give permission. You yield. So where is victory? Where does victory over the sinful desire lies? In giving our consent to Jesus. That's it. James chapter 4 verse 7. Submit your... That's it, my brother. Submit. Come on. Come on. Submit yourselves therefore to God. And God will give you power to what? Resist the devil, the king on the outside, and he shall flee from you. Draw nigh unto God, and he shall draw nigh unto you. Satan knows this, the power of the will. This is why Satan allows us and tempts us to eat and drink things that weaken our brain power. Yes, this is why Satan tempts us to listen to perverted music. 
which inspiration says, uh, the perverted music which are now being played in many Seventh-day Adventist churches, inspiration says those music distort the mind. How then can you think straight? How then can you give consent to Christ? That means when somebody does give their heart to God in those uh, atmosphere and condition, it was a mighty miracle from Jesus. Give your consent, it says. He did not consent to sin. Listen, not, not even by a thought did Jesus yield to temptation. So it may be with us. So it may be with us. One more time, what it says? So it may be with us. Is your hope for us then? Not even by a thought did our Savior sin. Can we have victory over sin even in our thoughts? Where is the secret? 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4 says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. This is why we are told young people and adults, commit a text to memory daily that spiritual life may exist in your souls. But the majority of us, we are running, operating on empty. How far can your motor vehicle take you if the gas thing says empty? How far will you get, my friends? We are running on empty, not even by a thought did Jesus sin. So it may be with us. It goes on. Listen, he was, listen, Christ's humanity was united with divinity. He was fitted for the conflict by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And he came to make us partakers of the divine nature so long as we are united to him. By faith, sin has no more dominion over us. So how, what must we do then so that sin doesn't have dominion over us? We have to unite. He is divine. We are what? The branches. We must unite with Christ. How do we unite with him, my friends? How? How? Come on, talk to him. How? Just read his word. Meditate. And what does it mean to meditate? Huh, friends? It means to keep replaying the thought over and over in your mind until you are spiritually strengthened. This is meditation. And some of us, what we call devotion is not devotion. It's reading a book, a scripture, and running out, but we do not spend time to meditate. It says, friends, it says, listen, it says, and how is this to be accomplished? Christ has shown us by what means did he overcome in the conflict with Satan? By the word of God. Only by the word could Christ resist temptation. Only by what? Listen to this. Listen to what this says. Great Controversy, page 623. Listen to what this says. Everyone together what it says. Now, let's read. Now while our great high priest is making the atonement for us, we should seek to become perfect in Christ. Is that the present truth? Is that Christ's work now in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary? Is that work about to close? How must we be found? In what condition? In the condition of perfection. It says, listen now. Now we read in Desire of Ages, page 123. This now is great controversy, 623. Not even by a thought could our Savior be brought to yield. Let's read. To the power of temptation. Listen now. Satan finds in where? In human hearts. Some point where he can gain a foothold. That's it. Some sinful desire 
is cherished by means of which his temptations assert their power. So why are men of us demon possessed? Why are men of us struggling with sin, liquor drinking, smoking, cursing, swear words? Why? Why are some of us still holding on to unforgiveness, malice and grudge? Why? Why? It says we have left a door open to our hearts. And some of us are excusing a sin in our lives. God told me to say this. Some of us say, well, but Pastor, this one thing, I don't know if I can ever get victory over it. What is that one thing? Do you know why you say you can't get victory over it? You have not yet declared that thing a sin. That's it. You have not yet called the thing a sin. Now call it what? A sin. And once you call it a sin, what did sin do to Jesus? Crucifies him. It's not until we take that sin and bring it to where? Come on, say to serve now. We, where? We bring that sin to Gethsemane. And we meditate in our minds. And we see, we say, Lord, search me, O God. Let me see what this sin has done to you. And when the Holy Spirit begins to paint that picture in your mind, that that sin is what crucifies Jesus. That sin caused men to spit on Jesus. And friends, it wasn't men, it's you who is spitting on Jesus. That sin is what caused men to spit. Jesus is not man. It's you. Every sin we commit, we crucify Jesus afresh. When Christ cried out on Calvary's cross, Oh, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We can see it. And the Holy Spirit will say, If you do not let go of that sin, that sin will separate you from me forever. And when you cry, my God, my God, my Lord, 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 what will he say? De oh, my friend. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Call it a sin. Go to Gethsemane. Go to Calvary. Spend a thoughtful hour each day, my friend. Close the door. You say, what, well, pastor, I have done that and the sin is still with me. Then here it is. Go in your closet. Spend time in prayer and fasting. And you don't leave that prayer and fasting time until you feel the strength of God. Amen. No, you don't want victory. No, you want to keep on excusing that sin. Go to Zechariah as we close. Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 3. You don't want victory. Go in your closet. But what if it takes me two days? Stay there. Why do you think Christ spent 40 days in that wilderness fasting and praying? Not because he had any sins, but he's showing us we may need to spend days in fasting, days in praying to get victory. How much do you want victory? Or do you just want to be a foolish virgin? You love being around the truth. But it's a truth in your heart. You love to profess your seven-day Adventist. But it's seven-day Adventism in your heart. Come on, friends. Listen as we close. GC 623. It says now, but Christ declared of himself what? The prince of this world. Let's read. Cometh and what? and hath nothing in me. Skip on down the last sentence, what it says. Come on, it's, come on. This is the condition in which uh, those must be who shall stand in the time of trouble. Desire of ages says, uh, this is the condition you may have. This one says you must have. No joke, my friends. Zechariah, we close. Do you know why I have to give you Zechariah? God told them, turn northward. And as they were journeying northward, two kings stood in their way. 
Last application. Those two kings were led by the devil. Listen, and as God was about to bless Israel, as God was about to bless Joshua and his family, the Bible tells us that Satan stood up to withstand Joshua. No, you can't bless Joshua. You can't bless Joshua. And some of us, all of us right now, Satan is waiting outside these doors. And he's saying, keep on preaching. They haven't surrendered. And when this service is over, they're going to go back home and do the same sinful things. They are mine. And the thought comes to my mind is this. Why do you think Satan was contending over the body of Moses when Christ descended to raise Moses? Because Satan's words were partially correct. And if it's partial, it's wrong. Did Moses sin? And now Satan said, because Moses sinned, he's mine. I am the king of Moses. I'm standing to withstand him. You can't get him. And what the Lord said. You have seen one side, but on the other side, Moses surrendered. And now he has made me his king. And while you, Satan, as a king, stood up against him. Now he has chosen me as the king of kings. And I will stand for my Moses. Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Moses, come on home. Come on home, Moses. And listen now, if we're holding on to any cherished sin, we are giving the devil ample evidence to say, he is mine. She is mine. And if we should die, he's going to say, they are mine. We were driving here this morning. And as we took 429 coming here, I think it was Christian saw it. That in accident on the other side of the highway, a terrible accident. This car flipped how many times you could see it. It was crushed up. I said, son, let's pray. Let's pray. And it hit me. Where were they going? They did not get to their destination. And some of us, we take life for granted. And your life is so uncertain. Will you surrender all to Christ today? Because as Satan stood up to withstand Joshua, he's mine. God said again in Zechariah chapter 3, the Lord rebuke you. He said, take off the filthy garment from Joshua and clothe him with the new garment. Put a fear crown, a fear mitre upon his head. Can you imagine, my friends, if we just surrender? And Christ comes and Satan says, no, you can't take him. No, you can't take her. They are mine. What will the Lord say? You wouldn't even answer him. Won't even answer him. Won't even get into a controversy with Satan. Can you imagine Christ covering us now, friends? Covering us now. No more garments like these. Can you imagine Christ putting a crown of life upon our head? And listen, evangelism. Listen, every crown will have what? A star. Do you know some stars, some crowns will have more stars? I wonder who is going to be in heaven saying, oh, my crown don't have as many stars as your crown. <laughs> so when must we give up covetousness? When must we give up envy? It's now, my friends, that so God can seal us. Are you going to allow the devil to withstand you, hinder your salvation? Uh-huh. You said no. So what must you do? How can God ever give you a clean garment? What must you do with your filthy garment? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I want this song. I want this song. I want this song. Lord Jesus, I long to be whole. I want thee forever to live in my soul. Break down every barrier cast out every foe lord wash me and i shall be whiter than snow lord wash me 
Do you want this experience today, my friends? Lord, break down every barrier. Who are the barriers? The kings, the devil on the outside, the sinful desires on the inside. Break down every barrier, dear God. Cast out every foe. Wash me. Who wants the washing today, friends? Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. While the heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Respond to God today, friends. Respond to God. Save to serve international. I want to give your heart to Christ right now. First stanza, chorus.